Hello everybody, welcome to the city of Tokyo. This is Tsukishima. I'm back after three wonderful days filming in Coach Prefecture. I don't know if you saw those live streams, check them out. But the photo that you see up on the top here, let me enlarge it. This is Skiji Market. This is the old fish market it used to be where you saw the fish auctions and you can see all the people spilled out on what is a, a street that cars are supposed to be able to drive through. And they do drive through just really slowly not to hit people but a lack of crowd control has created this havoc and it shouldn't be like this and local authorities this is a big issue that uh, people are talking about all the time that's been in the news today that's crazy right this is just a normal street in tokyo that again is supposed to be able to ride your bicycle and uh, um, drive through you can't do it anymore so this word over tourism has now really become a part of the conversation here in Japan, mainly because locals are getting frustrated and it's not their fault. The local municipalities in particular don't have solutions to the incredible number of tourists that are all of a sudden coming to areas, including Kyoto, which doesn't make sense because they should have answers for this, Kyoto being the world famous city where everybody wants to go. Uh, but we've seen over the last couple of months in particular, where prices on things that we beloved, we really loved, like the JR Rail Pass, has increased. A lot of it has to do with over tourism. And just yesterday, I think it was yesterday, there was an article showing that uh, Prime Minister Kishida is going to be drawing up measures, this is from the Japan Times, uh, to combat over tourism. And it made me think, like, how do you combat over tourism? And then I started to look at the things that Japan has been doing. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about what exactly is over tourism and what are the solutions. And I want to hear from you who are watching. Leave me comments. And again, there's a live chat going on here. So I want to hear what you think if this will impact your trip to Japan. Um, I don't think that this is going to really impact Japan too much because people are going to come anyways. Here's the article. He was in um, uh, Naha recently and it said here, Prime Minister... Uh, uh, Fumio Kishida said Saturday that his government plans to draw up measures as early as autumn to combat over tourism, which surges of visit visitors have ne negatively impacted the daily lives of local residents. This is probably mostly Kyoto talking about it, but I'm sure there's some skiji residents here too. At a time when the number of foreign tourists in Japan is recovering from the COVID 19 pandemic, addressing concerns about issues caused by the concentration of tourists is an important task for the government. Really? Kishida told me, I don't know if it's if it's important for the, the for his government, but the thing is the prime minister's poll numbers are way, way, way down. He might be, he's very unpopular here in Japan, so I guess he's coming up with things domestically that might want to improve the relationship with the people here. Because opening up Japan to tourism, kind of his fault, People, some people feel, which is misplaced. Um, there's a, I, I got a lot of things that I want to show you here. Um, this is not a new problem. In 2019, the discussion for over tourism started 2018, 2019. And just recently, there was the, I think they, they've already done it, but Kyoto has banned day bus passes. Now, a lot of people who came to Kyoto, came to Japan, relied on those bus passes to get around because it was just so easy. You just like would put it through and, and, and like just touch it or something, you'll be able to get on. Now you could still use your Suica card or, or your Pasmo, your Ikoko IC card if you can find them, but those cards have been also impacted by over tourism where tourists don't return them, they take them home and there's not enough in the supply chain system um, to keep them going for everybody. So there's like lots of little issues like this that's really impacting um, people's experience. The good news, this is the end of the summer. So I'm guessing that things should get a little bit lighter, right? Maybe, because just this month, Chinese tourist packages, packaged tourists from China just started to come to Japan, and now we're seeing a lot of people coming in. Uh, the summer traffic for holiday uh, students that were visiting here in holiday, that'll be over, but a new traffic wave is coming, and uh, it makes sense that Japan is trying to find a way to address this. I just wonder what those things are. So. I was actually, right, Carrie wrote, wrote in here something good. We can look at what other countries have done and see what they've done to address it. And if you're coming to Japan in the autumn, this might impact your trip. 
So let's take a look at it. I actually put a link in the description of this video where you can take a take a look at this. This is what, what I'm going to show you right here. But I'm going to run through this as, as quickly as possible. This is from I guess it's like a, a Kanko site, Mina Kanko site uh, that's written in English here. I'm going to push record and try my best to go through it. It'll keep me honest. I'm not actually scrolling. Um, but it says here, what is over tourism? Uh, here is an easy to understand explanation of causes, remedies, and actual example cases. I share this because it's the only article that I could find that's Japanese based uh, that talks about this issue. And I think it's going to be talked about quite a bit more uh, in English to help you understand. And this just comes out of Kamakura. All right, let's start it. I just pushed uh, the play button. So it's going to scroll up here. The impact caused by the new coronavirus uh, for the tourism industry is significant. So this is an old article, rather. Uh, so we get all this shrink in it, but this is something that they've been talking about. What is over tourism? Uh, direct translation is excessive tourists. It refers to a state in which the extreme concentration of tourists has great negative impact on the daily lives of the people here. What happens when over tourism becomes severe? There are very specific changes. Uh, it basically, things like uh, parking violations, noise pollution, garbage problems, um, vehicles going in the wrong place, just a lot of congestion like I showed you in the beginning of this. Uh, furthermore, spelled wrong, uh, the experience that the tourists can get, such as dirty streets, buses are full, it, it becomes a bad experience for other tourists as well. Well, I can push, I can actually push pause here. Over tourism is caused by the number of tourists exceeding the upper limit of the tourist destination can accept. Mount Fuji recently um, started to throttle the number of people who could climb it, meaning if you didn't get in at the start of the day to climb Mount, F Mount Fuji, it meant that you were not going to climb it at all that day because Mount Fuji had reached its limits. The more tourists that went on there, the more trash that they had, the more toilets became over full. These aren't pipes running down the mountain. Um, I think they have to bring the, the poo down. So that garbage and everything just became too much for, for the infrastructure that they had for it, and in particular on the Yoshida route. So uh, the tourists were throttled this year, and it made for a, not a great experience for a lot of tourists because there's not a mechanism to let you know when not to go, right? How many people have come? You should have like, a, oh, in two hours, we're going to be ending kind of a deal. But they didn't have these kind of mechanisms, and it led to some frustrating people. So. Japan is clamping down on over tourism and they're trying to find ways to do it. It's interesting. Um, this article suggests and, and shows some of the things that they have done. In today's age, day and age where information can spread everywhere by everyone, it is no longer possible to contain information that does not escalate too much. Meaning, an influencer such as me introduces a beautiful place to someone such as you. All of a sudden, a mass amount of people are going to be going to that spot and this can create some big problems. My first uh, experience with this was in the year 2015 when I introduced a capsule hotel that was mostly for business travelers, but they were starting to gear up for tourism. I introduced it and the video went viral and the manager ended up having, now when I went back and talked to him, he said that it's almost all foreign tourists and more issues came up. He almost was regret regretful that I would introduced the place because it brought more, more problems such as larger suitcases. There just wasn't enough space to accommodate tourists that came there because that's not what a capsule hotel is. It's not a tourist attraction. It's a place for businessmen who have very little luggage to crash. Just literally spend the night in a capsule, wake up and leave. But tourists were spending like two weeks there with their big suitcases. There's no place to put it and it created a lot of problems. I'm to blame, but you know, we didn't know about this so much back in 2015, 2014, when social media was just really starting to, to uh, increase. Um, I, I want to show you another issue. This is, by the way, the postcard club. Uh, this is this month's postcard. If you want to support the channel, you can get this. This is um, uh, them cleaning the, the uh, Daibutsu, the big Buddha at Todaiji. And I bring this up because Todaiji has been um, a victim of over-tourism. In 2019, they caught Chinese tourists that had put some sort of vandal, like vandalized it with some sort of oil rubbed on the wood, which was really, really disgusting. And uh, that created problems. And then this image I'm going to show you right now, this is uh, what happened just a few weeks ago where a Canadian tourist, I know, I'm surprised too, actually took his fingernail and drew a cat 
into thousand year old wood. All right. Well, I don't, I can't say it's a thousand year old, but very old wood. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And any kind of vandalism like this, of course, is going to reflect poorly on Canadians, North Americans, I should say. Um, but it, it reflects poorly on foreign tourists overall. And this is a thing where there's just too many tourists where they, they can't watch everybody. So in the end, stuff like this happens. And like now they got to put in video, like uh, CCTV and have security guards and, and monitor a, uh, a thousand year old, you know, a 1300 year old uh, site. And that's not right either. Right now in Skiji, they have a, a, a massive problem. And the thumbnail of this video that you saw is in Nara, where this was actually taken. Uh, Nakatani-do is one of the most popular mochi places. Maybe you've seen the guy who's doing like this with his hand a thousand seconds, you know, a thousand times per second, um, pounding the mochi. He has a problem where the tourists are all watching the show, but it's still a road. And he has to find a way, he has to hire somebody. Now he has a, hired somebody with a glow stick who gets people to back off and, and line up properly or else it reflects poorly on his business. Nada is doing it right. That's probably the best solution to that. But I'm finding that Skiji does not have that yet. And, and for me, again, like here's the video. It, it's, it's perplexing to me that no, there isn't a way to get the people to the sides because there's just too many of them, in particular in front of some of the uh, really popular, really famous uh, street food. And the other thing is that littering has become a massive problem. There's going to be always a little bit of litter, but when you have this many people in one place, it becomes a mega problem. And there's just too much trash at the end of the day. Residents, and this is a place where people live, they don't like it. And uh, you can understand why. Um, they don't want to change their culture either. So it's almost like having your cake and eating it too. But there are no trash cans, but the restaurants and the shops should be taking uh, responsibility for it. There should be a place to get it, but because the lines are so long, they can't actually make it to the front to throw the stuff away. So a small percentage of people just throw it on the street. And it's got sauce on it, it's really nasty, the crows come in, rats come in, and you have other issues that the community doesn't like, and it's hard to battle. So what do you do about it? Let's go back to that article um, that I brought up. Again, I put a link to the in the description here, and it's just it's it's not a well written article, but it does. There's a lot of typos, like, which probably shouldn't happen, uh, but not in a print article. But it it also brings up a lot of issues and a lot of the solutions that Japan is thinking about. So when Kishida-san talks about the solutions to over tourism, I think he might be referring to articles or ideas from something like this. So let's go over some of them. Um, Kanazawa had an issue with street food. Uh, in particular, tourists from one or two countries would litter quite a bit. So what they did was they banned street food in Hagashi Chaya, which is a very popular area of Kanazawa. Um, you could not eat your, you could buy the food, but you had to eat it inside the store. They weren't like food stands. So this cut down on the amount of traffic on the street, made it more peaceful. It, it made sure people stayed in the shops, but it also, um, it kind of killed the feeling of, of fun there. I'm not sure if they still do that, but you know, when you have to eat takoyaki inside of a shop, you know, well, it's air conditioned, so that's not too bad. It kind of ruins the experience when you're like told you cannot eat outside. But that's the reaction to over tourism, something like this. Um, so this is talking about the, the local impact. Buses are full, not welcomed by locals. Locals just get angry. That you, you lose that, that loving feeling and it's gone, gone, gone. Oh, oh, oh. So what is the reason behind it? It's just a misunderstanding. It's, it's a lack of communication, I think, from the government or municipalities, uh, but also a lack of control, right? Things can get out of hand with social media really quickly. So how do you deal with it? Well, they got limit the number of tourists. You see at the bottom here, limit the number of tourists. And how do you do that? Well, in order to do that, right now Japan is raising the price of stuff for tourists in particular things that tourists use, like the JR Rail Pass, right? So the JR Rail Pass, we saw the number, the price is gonna increase extraordinarily high in October. 
I believe it's not just because it's, it's, it's a direct result of the fact that the Tokaido line is just overly crowded. All the tourists that buy the JR Rail Pass, they're all riding the Tokaido line. And for better or for worse, this is creating an amazing amount of uh, traffic that is putting pressure on people like me who want to ride the Nozomi, want to ride the Shinkansen uh, for business. And I can't do it because there's just too many big bags and, and uh, um, I can't get off the train in time because in popular places like uh, Kyoto or Shinosaka, there's too many people on the train. You only have a minute. They tell you to stand up and get ready to go. But tourists don't do that. They stand up at the worst time. So then you, they're, they're trying to get ready to leave the train and you can't get out. And this is a problem um, for people like me. This is how you can understand. Like I can't get that JR Real Pass, so I'm all for raising the price. You can, uh, you can think that I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't, I think it was too good of a deal. All right, let's look at some of the comments here, and then we're going to take... Uh, oh, oh, wait, hold on. Let's go over the, all of the uh, uh, solutions. Divide the tourists by cooperating with neighboring municipalities. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, but how do you do that? I'm not sure. This is the one where they're going to talk about incorporating accommodation tax. Hmm. By allocating tax revenue for measures to accept more, accepting more tourists, such as making... So that the idea is the taxes that they collect in Kyoto go back into improving the tourism infrastructure to help ease the pain. I don't think that that's what's happening because they've been collecting this tax for a while now and I'm not sure what investments Kyoto's making but I don't see the transparency and this is always a problem when government ex accepts taxes of any kind. A lot of it doesn't go to the purpose that it was intended to. So uh, I mean I don't, I'm not seeing it. I think Kyoto should not be, if they have this tax, Kyoto should not be complaining at all. They should be using that money in order to improve the flow of tourists to alleviate this kind of problem. This one is interesting, promote hands-free tourism. Um, most tourists visiting Japan are traveling individually. It's not packaged tours. Traveling with a lot of luggage on your own requires a lot of space on trains. I'm doing this. I'm telling you to bring less bags, to pack day packs, Leave your, send your bags by Takubin or, or the courier services from hotel to hotel. The night before you check out, um, take the things you need for the day and send your main suitcase to the next hotel. It'll arrive the next day. Do things like that and help to alleviate this because there's too many tourists, in particular from, from Western countries, that love to wheel suitcases everywhere. The, the Asian countries, a lot of them won't bring the suitcases. They, they're on package tours. But that's not exactly 100% fair. There are urgent, you know, Asian tourists that are also wheeling massive suitcases. The suitcases look bigger if they're really short too. I found like <laughs> just putting that out there. The, the big, bigger people with with massive suitcases, those suitcases don't look so big, do they? So I, I think that this is a good thing. This helps alleviate some of the pressure uh, that is felt from over tourism, especially for people like me, a local. Um, this one is weird. The international certification system. I guess the GSTC, which is uh, the minimum items to be observed. I, uh, effective. Sus, sus, okay, perhaps this is important for places like Tsukiji because they're so over the top crowded. This is just a photo. Look at that. They're so over the crop, ta uh, crop um, crowded. They don't have any regulations on these local vendors to do more than they need to do. And this creates a lot of problems. Either, either the tourism association or the, the, the um, neighborhood association for Tsukiji needs to step up and do something, or the vendors need to step up and do something, um, or the city is going to do it. And if the city does it, it's going to be worse for the vendors. Whenever the city does anything, they really lock it down, just like Kanazawa locked down Higashi Chaya with street food. That's not something that uh, any, any people want, right? But this one was interesting here. So this is from, this actually comes from uh, April 2nd. And the news is, is that uh, Kyoto to abolish one day bus passes to combat tourism. And you know, I, I couldn't quite understand how the bus passes combat tourism. So I, I went in deeper. Hey, Jersey girls here from Utah. I carry a plastic shopping bag in my tote bag to hold my garbage until I can find a garbage can. You need that in Japan. The problem is you can't find those plastic bags easily because you can't get them at convenience stores unless you ask for them and they will they will charge you 
five yen, about three to five yen for each one of those bags, so there's less of them available, which is not a bad thing, cut down on plastic. But if you can't find a trash can, there's no place to put your trash. So ask for a plastic bag at the convenience stores when you get something like onigiri or something. Then at least you have a bag to put it in. Thanks for the tip. Thanks for sharing that. So I went in and I wanted to um, read a little bit more about this uh, one-day pass. So here, here, here's what we got here on the right side. Um, I'll read from the top. The supported routes uh, will get you around pretty much to the major tourist attractions. There's a subway in Kyoto, but it's not very good. It doesn't drop you off in convenient places and you have to walk quite a bit. But the subway is a more effective manner to get around. The issue is that when there's so many tourists on board, and this is a valid issue, I want you to see it from the side of the residents living in Kyoto. Kyoto residents, the ones that live in the city center, a lot of them are, are over the age of 65. It's just a fact of Japan that we have a lot of overaged, uh, uh, I shouldn't say, seniors, seniors, people over the age of 65. And uh, a lot of them are young, have more energy than me, just to put that out there. Uh, it's true. The, but the issue is that a lot of them don't, and they can't find seats on the bus anymore. In, in particular, priority seating, where tourists are sitting there, or kids are sitting there, and they're not giving up the seats for the local residents that need it. And that's an issue. So they can't ride the buses, they can't even get on the buses, and sometimes they have to queue up for the buses for hours. Uh, if you look at Kyoto Station, the queue for the bus can be as long as, can be like 45 minutes to get on a bus when they probably could have gotten a taxi and they've and been back in time if they just, you know, spent a thousand yen instead of trying to wait for the bus. But that's maybe the issue with the day bus passes. People re were reliant on that too much when there were other manners to get around. You could still use your Suica and Pasmo card, but it says here, unfortunately though, the pass seems to have become too convenient for travelers and in the process, an inconvenience for locals. And so the city government has announced that the Kyoto one day bus pass will be abolished. <laughs> take that seniors. I'm sorry, take that tourists, the seniors. Seniors one, tourists nothing. Honestly, I don't think I don't think uh, I don't think that you need to have a, a bus pass to get around Kyoto. You can r rent a bicycle, walk, get a taxi, take the subway. There's lots of other ways. And if we if they diversify it, then I think it takes off congestion on the buses. So in a way, I think it does work. Uh, Kyoto Station said that in the morning, the lineup for the bus whose route includes the stops for Kiyomize Dera, Kiyomize Temple, uh, Yasaka Shrine, is often so long that those who join the line at the back might have to wait for three or four buses to come through before there's enough space for them to get in. They pack them in too, and that's not comfortable for locals, and they shouldn't have to do that. Such crowded conditions aren't new, as I said, which makes me wonder what Kyoto has been doing all this time to fight over tourism? Anything? I don't know. Why is this an issue now? It shouldn't be something new. But the banning of the bus passes, I think, will help to alleviate that a little bit. But if so many tourists come, that is uncontrollable. That's where the federal government or the national government comes in and where Kishida-san has a problem. Tak 178 is here. I will be coming to Tokyo after a long time away. That is a long time. I hope that my less touristy methods of travel can help alleviate the problem. You know, I, I want to point this out to you. I'm not telling you that it's your fault. I'm just trying to give you, I'm trying to give you the reality here on the ground. Actually, I, in a way I am saying it's your fault. But what I'm doing is trying to give you solutions that might help you um, have a better experience in Japan and understanding this side of Japan, the, the local side, will help issues that could possibly be, become more of an issue. And uh, it's, it's important, in, in particular when you're going to a country, uh, you know, at, in a high season, where things are really short, where fuses really are shorter. WRX Turbo is in the house. I still gotta find a theme song to play <laughs> when you're here, thanks for that. A uh, Jay Jersey girl also writes in here, I put some items in plastic shopping bags in my luggage. That is smart because I know it's hard to find garbage can in Japan. Bring them from home. Um, a lot of people will, will put the garbage in a bag. In particular, if you're going to Tsukiji Market, you know to be ready for it. And then you can just carry it out. 
you, you carry it back to your hotel and you throw it away there. Or you can take it to a convenience store and usually they have receptacles inside. They don't want, they, they gotta be the ones to pay for the people to take out the trash then. But they put it inside the convenience store, but a convenience store, one of the purposes is to be convenient, so. There you go. Um, yeah, so we're seeing more and more of this. The headlines for the other media here, uh, Japan is rammed with tourists and Chinese visitors aren't even back yet. Like that's, that's, was a few months ago. Here's, here's one from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, what do they write here? Japan deci decides tourism pollution is worth it as money floods in. That's the other word to over tourism, tourism pollution. I thought that was uh, interesting. I mean, I don't think it's, this is a view of um, Hachiko Scramble about, oh, there go the Mario cards, about 20 minutes ago before I started this live stream. And you can see like, it looks the same. And, ha and Shibuya Scramble is as popular as it gets, you know? Asakusa is more crowded than Shibuya right now. I think um, people just spend more time there. But you can see as they cross the street, this is nothing new. This is they've had this since 2013 when the tourism boom started, right? And YouTube and social media started to really, really show the beauties of Japan. <clears throat> I admit to have played a small part in that, along with a bunch of other really talented um, creators. <laughs> but that's our job. That's what we try to do here. That's, that's uh, you know, every single location around the world has, um, can I get rid of that? Ha has, has, is going to have these issues here. And I think you're going to find more places start to add taxes that you don't like. But the purpose of the tax is to help with the solutions for tourism. But the thing is, again, these, these measures will take some time. But we will not see, I have not seen how these taxes are really helping to alleviate it. Because if this is still a problem, and 2019 was so crowded, so crazy, and you could see the trend line going all the way, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, just like this of tourists coming in. Why in a country that is like, you know, Toyota, they have people always looking for issues and how to fix them, which makes Toyota one of the great car companies in the world that thinking that mentality is part of Japan, why local governments are not doing that is beyond me. And there's no real check, check and balances between is this money really being used for the purpose that it is intended to, or is it going to other things? I just don't know. But I can tell you this, in Tokyo, there's free Wi-Fi just about everywhere. A lot of the phone booths have been turned into Wi-Fi places, and I believe that comes from the taxes that you pay when you come into Japan. Um, there are more information offices with speakers of English now than there were in 2017. That's a good thing. So I can see the money being put to use there. I don't know if you guys are actually using them, but there are more of them. Um, station staff at busy places like Ueno Station, uh, Ueno, uh, Tokyo Station. People get on me if I, if I say it in an English accent, an American accent. Uh, Shinjuku, we're, we're finding staff is, is getting English lesson training so they can... I remember when foreigners, uh, you know, Westerners who couldn't speak any Japanese would try to talk with Japanese staff and they would just get like this and it, would, it was just, uh, you couldn't communicate at all. Now I'm finding that staff can speak, can answer simple questions that are common of foreign tourists almost everywhere in Tokyo. That's a result of them learning English and having training. And I think that that's a really good thing, a result of the tax dollars. But where do you go from there? Do you need more, do you need tourism police? Do we need to hire um, people that are ambassadors for municipalities to help alleviate or, or get people to go in different directions? Is that something that they really should do? He's watering the tree there. <laughs> I mean, what are some ideas that you think visitors would need to do do you think Japan gave this, so this is a question from Walter in the live chat here. Do you think Japan gave this problem serious thought? It seems like they didn't have any plans in order. They had plans, but I don't think they were effective plans. And 
to me, it's curious that they haven't had solutions for this. It shouldn't. This is not a new thing. Changes won't impact interest from a group of people watching and only in Japan stream, but it may make people who are deciding between Japan and somewhere else choose to go somewhere else. That's true. But I think that a lot of the places that people, some of the people, but I think that Japan can afford that because it's just too much. There's a point where you're past the point of saturation and the, and the money coming in is great, but then the majority of the money coming into the country comes from industry, comes from um, the people who are living here, the 129 million people in Japan. I think that's the population now. It's going down. You know, that's where the majority of the money comes from, and you have to make sure the majority is kept happy too as we try to uh, accommodate the minority or the tourists that are bringing money into here. So I think it's going to be a balance. And all right, let me. I, I think that's a wonderful comment. Let me put it to you like this. I'm just going to squat down for a second. I didn't expect to go this long. The experience that tourists are having because there are so many tourists is not good right now. I think if you're going to Kyoto, you're not having a great experience. You are shoulder to shoulder with other sweaty Americans from different areas of the country, which if you want to meet other Americans is a lot of fun, but you're meeting other tourists and you're, you're so packed in like a, like a, a can of s sardines. Is that really what you were expecting on coming here to Japan? No. So I think there would be benefits to make trying to get people to go elsewhere or kind of wean out the kind of people that want to just go to Kyoto and stay three weeks there. When you could go to Kanazawa, where you could go to uh, um, uh, Takayama or go to Wakayama, go to Koyasan or some of the other places that don't have the same amount of tourists. I mean, I would hope that your experience in Kyoto was so bad that you would do that. But tourists don't do that. They just stay there. I don't understand. I feel that the whole tax thing, only tourists likely going to make people protest. Uh, I did a couple of days ago where the English menus, there's some restaurants have English menus and it's very rare, but they will add different prices onto those English menus than the Japanese menus. I've discovered that twice in my 25 years here, so it's not prevalent. One time the prices were lower than were on the Japanese menu, so it goes both ways they just forget to update it so it's quite often an honest mistake but the issue is not that the issue is that the there should be one menu and the English menu should be combined with the Japanese menu into one it should not be separate because then it, re it reduces any issues risks with misunderstanding and the surcharges the taxes the final price should be listed on there you should see the price and then the price with the tax. And they, they do that on the Japanese menus at a lot of the uh, um, family restaurants. You know what the final price is with tax and without tax. They used to do this when they rose the, the uh, sales tax for the first time about eight, eight or 10 years ago. And since then, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding with service taxes. There's no tipping in Japan, but some restaurants has a, have a service charge. The service charge can be a 300 yen like hors d'oeuvre, a, a, a complimentary dish that they give you, which is a seating charge. They charge you three to 500 yen for that, sometimes a thousand. Some bars will charge you a seating charge. They charge that to locals too. But how do you know it's not listed anywhere in English? So that's where the miscommunication comes in. And I think if Kishida-san wants to do something to alleviate issues, it's not just with the locals, it's with the tourists. They also have to know that <laughs> there's going to be a service charge and there's going to be a seating charge like things like this they need clearly to be mentioned on menus on the Japanese menu which it should be and on the English menu which is more than just um, how should I say like to trying to do a kindness to tourists by giving them an English menu it's more than that the English menu is this is your menu it doesn't matter if it's in Japanese or English it has to have the necessary information just like the Japanese menu, by law, should be there. You want to put in your policy. If you have, you're going to charge something, people should know on the menu or at the door so you know not to go in or go in. But this should, the, if you want to fix that, it should, that should be a law. Um, you know, I, I don't know. But this is where we are right now. And 
I hope, I, I know that you, when, those of you that are coming in the fall might not see this, but I, in 2024, we're going to have more tourists. I think Japan's going to hit 24, uh, 40 million tourists, which will put them in the top, top five. I think Japan will be in the top five tourist destinations next year. They've got, I think Fukuoka is going to expand their international routes. Uh, JAL has Zip Air, Japan Airlines has Zip Air, and ANA has Air Japan. These are two low cost carriers that are going to be starting operations. Zip Air is already running from several routes. So you're going to be able to travel to Japan super cheaper, I don't know how much cheaper, than just regular JAL or ANA, ANA. We say ANA in uh, English. In Japanese, we call ANA ANA. Uh, so you're going to be able to travel cheaper than ANA and JAL and even American Airlines on Zip and Air, Air Japan, which is the subsidiaries of the other com companies. That's going to bring in more people. And they're going to go to routes, I think, open up other airports like Sapporo can take more international flights. Fukuoka could definitely. Nagoya. You'll see more routes open up, more tourists coming in, and hopefully this gets you to go to other places besides just Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, Himeji Castle, and places like this. So, this tax and these raising of fees is going to be an issue next year, and you're going to see it, and I, I'm not apologetic. But I'm going to, please subscribe, because I'm going to make sure that we can not hold them accountable, but just when we see something good happening, I want to point that out. Like, if I see something that is a new service that makes your experience better, I want to point that out, not just the points where like oh it's bad and overcrowded it looks like this that's good too but i want to show you when something good is happening and i think that there's a lot of good happening behind the scenes a lot of small rural towns working really hard to get you to go there and they're coming up with an original ideas and i'd like to focus on this on my main channel and on this channel over the next year cobra bebop is here hey uh, will they raise the taxes and fees on hotel rooms until less people start to going to Kyoto? Sorry if I already mentioned this, just got here. Um, so the, the, the fee and tax for Kyoto hotels is, uh, I think it was not too much. I think it was like 300 yen or something. Or was it 3% of the bill? I can't remember, but there's a, there's, Kyoto was the first place, I believe, to initiate a tax on this. I have a feeling that they'll probably raise the tax if the tourists keep on coming like they are. You can't book any of the locals. Actually, I can't. Tokyoites can't book hotels in Kyoto because so many foreign tourists are going there, and that's a that's the market. That's the way it should be. But you know, if you're visiting from abroad, maybe there should be less incentives to get less people to go there. I don't know. I don't have the answers, and I'm hoping that maybe you guys in the in the comments can suggest to the government better answers so that they get it right and not, well, screw all of us, including themselves sometimes. Thank you, Cobra Bebop. It's great to see you here, and I appreciate it. Overcrowding, this comes from Animal Chatter. Overcrowding is not all over Japan. Sure, there are busy places, but it's part of the experience. I like going to a place that's popular, but it's not fun. In the summer, when it's hot, it's not fun. Shoulder to shoulder on a Kyoto bus for 20 minutes, it stinks, literally. But it's uncomfortable and it's not fun. If you have a crowded temple shrine, you're waiting in line for an hour, you get on a crowded bus, you go to a hotel where the services are, are less because there are demanding customers who can't speak the language, and you're frustrated all the time, that's not a great experience. Little things that have added up as a result of over tourism will impact your experience going to places like Kyoto. It does. It's just a, it's a reality of the tourism. Knowing that when you book your trip, spend less time in Kyoto, spend less time in Tokyo, go out to places that aren't crowded. Go early, wake up earlier. You know, you got jet lag, no excuse. Be the first one in line at the sky tree. Why wait three hours? You know, things like this, use your head. Hey, and I saw that. Wolf7, do not say I like Takeshita. It's, it's so not true. Avoid. All right, thank you for this. This is um, Mooncake in Kyoto Hotel Tax. Depends on the cost per night. Under 20,000 yen, it's 200 yen. I wish I, could, I wish I could pin your comment. 
um, five. 500 yen for over 50,000 yen. Or over 50,000 yen is 1,000 yen. So it's, it's fairly reasonable. Lynn writes in there, even though I am Japanese, I would refrain from visiting Kyoto. I've been there like 50 to 100 times, an incountable amount of times in my 25 years here for work, for tourism, because I live not far away from it. And I, I only go there if I have to. I love Kyoto. I had a great time in April when I was there this year. You can. I think everybody should visit Kyoto. But I also think you should not spend so much time there. Um, there's other places, and if you're a repeater, there are other places that are even better. You just have to watch the show. I showed you a place in, in uh, um, yesterday. Oh, can I show this to you guys? All right, click the like button right now. If we can get to, uh, how many likes do we have? If we can get to 500 likes, I want to show you something that I showed my Patreon supporters that that uh, that blew me away when I when I first saw the this drone footage. But it's going to completely blow you away. So let's see if we can get how many how many people do we got who liked here? We have to have some sort of goal. Where is it here? Oh, here it is. All right, I just added it in the playlist. Jason, all right, keep on liking here. We're near a goal for the next Boss Coffee member. Thank you, Wolf7. Rainier, I know you've already seen it. 425, all right, let's get to 500, Sir Lance. Everybody click the like button. Let's get to, let's community thing. It's kind of fun when you see it. We get to 500, I show a clip. So we all win. All right, I think we, we got there right now, right? All right, this is the clip here. Um, I slowed this down. I filmed this in 4K 30p. I used uh, Topaz Video AI. I slowed it down to 120p and I made it 8K so I could do something like this. This is actually 720p though, this final rendering from the 8K AI based rendering. This is the stream from three days ago. Please go back in the channel and watch this. It's only six minutes long, but I show you an amazing find. No people. You see that entrance in the top right? That's You go through a jungle to get here. This is what I'm talking about. This is why you are mistaken if you think that Kyoto is the best of Japan. It's not. There's so much beauty. Now watch this as I pivot to the seaside and you see the Pacific, the mighty Pacific from Kochi. Oh my gosh, look at that. And then my silhouette as we hit the sea. To me, the shocked. Wow. That is amazing. The parallax of the uh, drone going around. This is Japan. This is what I want you all to see. That's the experience. But it's not... That's not in Kyoto. It's elsewhere. And you have to find those places. And you have to work to get there. And you're rewarded for that. And that's what it's all about. You go to Kyoto, it's low-hanging fruit, my friend. You're going to get other people that are taking advantage of it. I'm just, this is just it's reality. Please do sign up for the postcard club. Right here. This is this month's postcard. Next month, I think it, I'm going to... I'm going to uh, remember a, um, a train, the postcard, I believe it's going to be the um, Hibakuresha, which is the A-bomb, the atomic bomb train. This, the train was bombed in World War II. It's, it was like, like pretty much destroyed, but it was fixed up and back on the line and, and st after 80 years is still running on the line. This is one that was bombed and like, it was just a couple hundred people. Everybody died on the train, except for one person and that from the bomb. And that train is still in use on the streets of Hiroshima. That's the postcard for next month. I wanna show you that train and share, you, share with you that experience in an episode coming up. At the end of September, that episode will go live on Only in Japan main channel. So, and Kyoto is bankrupt. I know, that's the irony, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too, my friend. But they're gonna try. 
Hey everybody, I, I want to say thank you for watching and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll keep uh, looking at these issues and it's good to discuss this because when you do come to Japan, these are going to be some of the issues that you face when you are here. And if you do come to Tokyo and you want to get away from the crowds, come to this street. This is also my backyard. This is Tsukishima. It's uh, turned into a pedestrian street. And on the left and right are Monjayaki restaurants. These are like Okonomiyaki, um, the Japanese pancake places, but it's the Tokyo version of it. And don't worry, you don't have to make it yourself. The staff will, will do it for you, and you'll have an authentic Tokyo experience, and there's not so many crowds here. It's so much more relaxed. Come in the evening when the lighting is different, and it just, it's just a really cool vibe. This is an island in Tokyo, so you can get here on the Yurakucho line, and uh, it, it, I recommend it. Put it on the list. All right, everybody. See you again in another live stream tomorrow. As we end the summer, I can't believe we're like at the end of it. This is the best backyard ever. I'm, I'm so happy where I live here in Tokyo. Best backyard ever. See everybody. Here's the station. Uh, and I think this is exit seven. So you can walk straight there and enjoy some monjayaki tonight. What do you think? See everybody.